frequent urinary tract infection, vaginal dryness, and superficial dyspareunia. We also give hormonal therapy to decrease the risk for osteoporosis among symptomatic women. And lastly, we prescribe HD for women less than 45 years of age who have experienced premature ovarian insufficiency or who had both their ovaries removed. This slide shows the absolute and relative contraindications to prescribing hormonal therapy. I'd like to talk about endometrial CA. It is listed under the relative contraindications rather than be grouped together with breast CA under the absolute contraindications, when in fact majority of endometrial cancers are of the endometrial type, which is estrogen dependent. Although a lot of gynecologists would be hesitant to prescribe HD to women who have been diagnosed and treated for endometrial CA, some would prescribe HD to symptomatic women who were treated for stage 1 and 2 well to moderately differentiated endometrioid adenocarcinoma. When you say stage 1 and 2, you are referring to disease that is confined to the uterus. So that theoretically, you should not worry about extrauterine microscopic residual disease that could be stimulated when you give these women hormonal therapy. In fact, between the years 1986-2002, there have been retrospective non-randomized case control studies, so the best level of evidence that we have are levels 2 and 3, wherein women who underwent hysterectomy for stage 1 and 2 endometrial CA were either given unopposed estrogen in the form of conjugated equine estrogen, and some of them were given continuous combined therapy. So again, your CEE and hydroxyprogesterone acetate. And it was seen that the recurrence rate was actually lower and the survival rate longer in the treated group compared to the group that did not receive hormonal therapy. So in practice, I actually prescribed combined continuous therapy to women who had been treated for stage 1 and 2, well to moderately differentiated endometrioid adenocarcinoma. Another drug that I find very useful is Stibolone. It is a gonadotomimetic, it has estrogenic, progestogenic, and uh, androgenic properties. It's very, very good. But if you look at the package insert, endometrial CA is listed down as one of the contraindications. And this is because Stibolone has not been tested on women treated for early stage endometrioid adenocarcinoma. However, among women with intact uterine, Tibolone has not been shown to cause either endometrial hyperplasia or endometrioid adenocarcinoma. Okay, so naturally when we see a, first, a woman for the first time and she may be a possible candidate for We have our oral tablets and we have transdermal preparations. For our local preparation, which is locally available as use of neutrogestant, you see it is the doxyprogesterone acetate that is usually used in hormonal therapy. But this neutrogestant, or my transprogesterone, has, does not have the androgenic or the glucocorticoid properties of FDA. And what happens when, when you give a woman this type of quadrupine of FDA, sometimes she will complain of mood swings, or weight gain, or fluid retention, and of course, women will not like that. And because it has an anti-mineral corticoid also, um, activity also, micronized progesterone seems to be the more ideal progesterone for women with risk factors for cardiovascular disease, Hypertension, venous thromboembolism, stroke, and breast CA. The transdermal estrogens, which actually contain estradiol, have a more favorable risk profile than the oral estrogen. 
and they seem to be more advantageous for women with diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular risk factors, and migraines. Okay, so this slide shows the various transdermal preparations that are available. We already have estoderm, that's the patch. I have seen a patient who was able to get hold of the gel, which is applied in the arm. There are also lotions available that are applied to the side and the back of the, the cap. There is also a spray that you apply on top of your inner forearm. Okay? So these are the transdermal preparations. Here you have a slide showing the local vaginal preparation. Also up there you have the cream. We used to have estriol, um, honestly cream, that contain estriol, which is very, very, very good for you to gentle symptoms, but right now we don't have that, no? So right now what we have is dinosaur. It has estriol, and it it's also used to treat mild vaginal bacteria. Okay, then down there you have the ring. On the lower right side, you have a peccary. The proliferative effect that estrogen has on the endometrium. And when you have a chance, okay, if you can shift them, or, sorry, aside from this, you can actually give them low dose oral contraceptive pills, no? if they are less than 50 years of age. Okay, so you start them on low dose OCPs. How will you know now that you can shift them to hormonal therapy? You can check for the follicle stimulating hormone. So if the FSH is the one that tells the ovaries to, okay, come on, develop your follicles, but then it will come out. Okay, so you check for the FSH between day six to seven during the placebo week. Right? They take a tablet, no oral contraceptive pill, they take something for 21 days, and then they, they go off the pill for seven days, or you have a placebo for the past for the next seven days. So you test the FSH on day six to seven, and if the FSH value is more than 30 um, MIU per ml, that means they are already postmenopausal. So now you can shift them to continuous combined hormonal therapy. Okay, so in a continuous combined regimen, you give an estrogen and a progestin every day. Okay, and you prescribe this to women who do not fulfill the criteria or the conditions for sequential hormonal therapy and to women who no longer wish to bleed every month. Okay, so the joke is, the joke used to be if Cleopatra can be risen from the dead and you give her sequential therapy, she will bleed. Okay? Okay, now we go to the benefits of HT. Now the benefits are said to be maxi maximized when HD is begun within three years. Some authors will say within 10 years from menopause and if the drugs are maintained at the minimal effective doses so as to lessen the risk. Okay? The first benefit is of course the improvement of vasomotor instability. As early as two to three years before menopause, menopause is the very last menstruation. So actually the term menopausal, you know, pertaining to the years after the very last menstruation, is wrong terminology. Because menopause is a single event. It is your last menstruation. And the period beyond your menopause is the post-menopausal period. Okay? So two to three years before the menopause, women will begin complaining of hot flashes. Like, I do not know if I feel hot because I'm experiencing one now or because the air conditioners are not working very well. Okay? So, they're on, yeah, I'm probably the first one. Okay? So, when you give a woman HT, no, you take away the profuse sweating and the night sweats that she usually complains of. No? And that's one of the complaints that women um, consult for. They say, no, I wasn't able to sleep because I felt very, very hot. I took off my blanket, I put on the aircon, I had to turn off the electricity no? So they try to modify their environment, but somehow this is not enough. And then the next day, they are very irritable because they were not able to sleep well. Okay, so 
HD would address this problem. Another complaint that patients would tell you would be one moment they are sweating, the next moment they are shivering. And this is because declining levels of estrogen narrows down the thermal neutral zone. This is the temperature difference at which sweating and shivering occur. No, so again, they cannot sleep, no? Because they're using the blanket, because if they think of the blanket, they are shivering, but if they put on the blanket, even if the electric fan is on, they're sweating so much, no? So again, they cannot sleep, and then the next day, they are consuming it. They are consuming it to their husbands, okay? So the husbands tell them to visit an obstetrician, okay? So of course, you advise them, lifestyle modification and environmental manipulation. See, included here is exercise. The higher a woman's BMI, the more severe the hot flushes are. Okay? So again, the stop smoking, decrease alcohol intake, decrease caffeine intake. Okay? Okay, for those who complain of basal water instability but you have contraindications, to hormonal therapy, they may be prescribed psychotropic drugs as well as the anti seizure drug gabapentin. Okay, some women say that their hot flushes are, are better after acupuncture or after attending yoga classes or, af or after doing, you know, slow respiration exercises. Okay, the second benefit, of course, is the alleviation of the urogenital complaints. I mentioned the frequent complaints of women with uh, urogenital symptoms, and this entails long term treatment. Local vaginal estrogen is the preferred mode of treatment for purely urogenital symptoms. Okay? And when you prescribe vaginal estrogen, there is no need to prescribe a progeny because there is hardly any systemic absorption with local estrogens. Some say that urge incontinence may be improved with hormone by hormonal therapy, however, this is not a consistent finding. Systemic HD seems to worsen urge incontinence. Hormonal therapy does not have any effect on stress incontinence, and T alone has wonderful effects as far as urogenital symptoms are concerned, and this is actually what I prescribe in women who also complain of heart flashes. Actually, people don't get rid of heart flashes. So that's the woman against osteoporosis, gets rid of heart flashes, it increases sexual libido and um, the sense of well-being. Okay, so of course you have reduction in your osteoporosis risk. See, so HT, including T alone, should be considered first-line treatment for symptomatic women between age 50 to 60. Hormonal therapy is not recommended for women beyond age 60, and the choice of drugs for decreasing the risk of osteoporosis now become your serms, your bisphosphonates, and your parathyroid. Hormone, which will be discussed later on by El Presidente. Okay? Cardiovascular disease, no benefits, decrease in cardiovascular disease. At age 35, a woman, no matter how healthful her lifestyle is, begins to form atherosclerotic plaques. By age 45 to 55, there is an acceleration of the formation of this atherosclerotic plaques, but they may still remain clinically silent. Okay, now let's just do a little review okay, of physiology. After menopause, there is an accelerated increase in levels of LDL and BMDL. No? So this is one um, associated with atherosclerosis with a slower downward trend of HDL, which is supposed to be cardioprotective. There is likewise an increase in proagulation factors, specifically fibrinogen and factor 7. The blood flow to vascular beds are generally decreased, and this is secondary to decreased prostacycline and increased endocrine levels in the endothelium. So that the vasomotor response to acetylcholine is one of constriction. 
estrogen generally reverses these changes so that the vasomotor response to acetylcholine becomes dilatory and blood flow to end organs is improved. In addition, estrogen also decreases angiotensinogen converting enzyme, thrombin, and plasminogen activator inhibitor, all of which have a net effect of further improving blood flow to organs. See? So estrogen is very important. So obviously, it is the direct vascular effects of estrogen rather than the lipid and lipoprotein changes that confer cardioprotection. This protection, however, is seen only in younger women and when hormonal therapy is begun within three years of menopause during which time the endothelium still responds to the vascular effects of estrogen and the procoagulant effects are buffered. If you have established atherosclerotic plaques already, the estrogen will not be able to exert its protective effect on the endothelium. HD should not be prescribed for primary or secondary prevention of coronary heart disease. There are a lot of benefits to HD, but you only stick to the four indications for prescribing HD. And when a woman starts on HD, this are the benefits she gets. Again, do not initiate HD in women older than 60 years of age. Diabetes mellitus. There seems to be a decreased incidence of diabetes mellitus among current users. And among diabetic women on HD, their LDL, triglyceride, HbA1c, and insulin levels are lower than the non-users, conferring a decrease in vascular risk in this subset of women. Okay? Risks. We we'll start with venous thromboembolism. Hormonal therapy has been shown to double the risk of venous thromboembolism. And this risk is further increased by confounding factors, namely obesity, advanced age, a history of previous thromboembolic episode, smoking, immobility secondary to illness or surgery, and cancer. See, that's why we also need to advise lifestyle modification to our, to our women. Okay? However, the absolute risk and risk of mortality is low for healthy women less than 60 years of age. And when we say healthy, meaning we don't, they, they haven't had any of the absolute contraindications and they said, no, they could never present with symptoms that could have pointed to, uh, to angina or an MI or um episodes, okay? So again, do not give to women more than 60 years of age. And the transdermal preparations seem to further decrease the risk of venous thromboembolism because they bypass the first pass hepatic metabolism. You see, everything that we take by mouth passes through the liver and about 30 to 50 percent of the drugs are actually inactivated. See, that's another um, advantage of giving transdermal estrogens over oral estrogens. No? When oral estrogens pass through the liver, 30 percent is already deactivated so that you do not get stable serum levels. Unlike the transdermal preparations, no? so you put them on the skin, they bypass the liver, and you get a more stable serum level of estradiol. Also, another effect of, another advantage of bypassing that liver is that, unlike oral estrogens, transdermal estrogens do not increase procoagulation factors, specifically factors 7, 8, and 9. They do not stimulate the liver to produce C-reactive protein, which is an acute phase protein that 
gives you know an idea as, which is uh, associated with adverse cardiac um, results. Likewise, it does not induce the liver to produce MMP9. So these are things that I just found out. No? MMP9 stands for matrix metallocopenase 9, no? and it plays a role in breaking up the atherosclerotic plaques. No? So if a woman has established disease and you give her an oral estrogen, this plaque may rupture and what happens? There's bleeding into the vessel and it's either they, she throws off those thrombi, or they become emboli, or the blood occludes the vessel and this may lead to coronary artery occlusion uh, or it may lead to pulmonary embolism, no? So it may affect both the arteries and the veins. Okay, it's given stroke. Now, this is a very, very rare event even among HD users and the risk does not appear to be increased in women less than 60 years of age. Again, transdermal estrogens seem to be favored over the oral estrogens because aside from not stimulating coagulant factor synthesis, they actually decrease triglyceride levels. No? So oral estrogens increase triglycerides, transdermal estrogens decrease triglycerides, and triglycerides are known to be an independent risk factor for stroke. Breast CA, the most controversial area. Data regarding the true effect of hormonal therapy on the incidence of breast cancer still remains contentious. And the effect of hormonal therapy may actually be promotional. Okay, like I was discussing with some of my classmates here. Let us go back to the Women's Health Initiative study. Now when it was printed in 2002-2003, there was actually a decline in the prescribing of hormonal therapy because of breast cancer care. The women put on estrogen and progestin not this study, not that study arm, no? where women were given estrogen progestin was prematurely terminated because after five years, about 387 of the women on HT, not out of 16,000 women, uh, divided into two groups, those given the hormone, not 387 of them developed breast CA compared to 293 in the placebo group no, who developed breast CA. Okay? So they terminated it and that was the initial result. And everybody stopped prescribing HT. So even patients become, became scared. But if you look at the population, only 10% of these women were between age 50 to 54. 20% were be between age 55 to 59, so more than two thirds were more than age 60. You know, and so if you look at the age cohort and you look at the risk of breast CA, let us go to the next slide here. The risk is actually very small. Okay, so let us uh, let us look at the, let us change the, uh, let's, what do you call this, let us look at the risk of breast CA in numbers, okay? So the actual background risk for breast CA in women aged 50 to 60 is about 2.8 per 100 women. Based on the age cohort study from the WHI, the relative risk from the use of combined hormonal treatment for five years was only 1.24. So relative risk of one would be assigned to the non-users. Okay, so those given hormonal therapy had a relative risk of 1.24. And the 24% translates to an overall risk of only 3.47 per 100 women, which is actually lower than the relative risk secondary to obesity. See, the relative risk for breast CA among obese women is 3.3. And it's even less than the relative risk of applied stewardess because of cosmic radiation. See? In fact, they say that the risk of giving HD to this group of symptomatic women who really need HD, 
the risk is similar in amplitude to that secondary to late menopause, early menarche, nullifarity, and drinking two to three units of alcohol a day. See? Two to three bottles of beer a day. Okay? You miss. We need to be moderate drinking is good for the heart. Actually, it's bad for the breast. Okay? So, because they say, you know, if you are a drinker, drink red wine. But if you are not a drinker, do not start drinking. Okay? So, again, let's try to put breast PA into perspective. One woman spared from breast CA by withholding hormonal therapy would have saved six women from dying of coronary artery disease. Okay? So we're so scared of breast CA. What we should be afraid of is coronary artery disease. So when we reach 65, and the asthma incidence, when the incidence is higher than it can really reach that age. No? Okay, and then we have cancer. Endometrial disease occurs only with unopposed estrogen. Okay? So we do not do that anymore. No? We always combine estrogen with the progestin in women with an intact in Jerusalem. And endometrial disease is signaled by bleeding in previously amenable women or a change in the character of bleeding in women on sequential treatment. If you prescribe continuous combined therapy to a woman, she will not stop bleeding immediately. Now, she may experience breakthrough bleeding for the next six to ten months. But the amount of bleeding should become less over time. If she continues to bleed, I'm talking continuous combined, if she continues to bleed beyond 10 months, you better investigate her for an endometrial problem. Or if you put her on sequential treatment, as I said, you expect predictable bleeding towards the end or immediately after the progestin phase. So that if she complains of increased amount of bleeding or increased duration of bleeding, then you should again investigate for endometrial pathology. Because although the addition of the progestin will protect the woman from developing endometrioid cancer, that is the estrogen type, that is the estrogen dependent type of tumor, she may develop one of the non estrogen dependent endometrial cancers and these are very aggressive. Okay, again, so the risk for endometrioid adenocarcinoma which is estrogen dependent is virtually removed or eliminated by giving a progestin but she is not spared from developing the more aggressive non estrogen dependent types of tumor. Conflicting data regarding the relationship between HT and ovarian CA exists, and this is probably because ovarian CA is still relatively rare, and the numbers of patients were insufficient in the studies that tried to elucidate the relationship between HT and ovarian CA. At any rate, the risk, if any, becomes a concern only after prolonged use of hormonal therapy. In summary, Hormonal therapy is not for everyone and generally should not be initiated in women 60 years old or older. You may, however, prescribe them local vaginal estradiol to address their urogenital complaints. The minimum and the benefit to this ratio should always be assessed. Okay, thank you for listening. Um, have a nice day.